Spectator TV is picking up thousands of new subscribers every week and you should be one of them. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon so you never miss an episode. From next year, Canada will expand its assisted death laws so people with mental illnesses can choose to end their own lives. In his Spectator column this week, Douglas Murray wonders what lovely Liberal Canada is doing. He joins me now. Douglas, thank you for joining us on Spectator TV. Um, you write in the magazine this week about how Canada is expanding its assisted dying laws in what sounds like a pretty horrific way. Uh, can you tell us about it, please? Yes, I mean... Long-term readers of the magazine will know I've written about this in the magazine before. There's an incredibly complex uh, uh, and intense debate about assisted dying. And there are good arguments on all sides. Um, but one of the points that I've made repeatedly in the magazine in, about different countries in recent years is the necessity of making sure that if you are talking about assisted dying for the, uh, the uh, terminally ill who can have nothing done uh, to help them, effectively a sort of slightly earlier palliative care, um, you've got to be extremely careful that this doesn't expand. And uh, I wrote some years ago, having spoken to doctors who did euthanasia in the Netherlands and Belgium, that the, the old slippery slope argument we hear about in people usually use as a dismissal. They say, oh, you're getting all slippery slope on us. I said, well, here is an ethical question where the slope is really slippery. Uh, it was in Belgium. Uh, again, last year I wrote about the case of the young woman who was um, was killed by the state, allowed to die by the state, we'll phrase it as you will, um, because she had PTSD from surviving the Brussels airport attack in 2016, where she saw many of her classmates, she was 17 at the time, uh, blown up in front of her. The Belgian state is far too civilized, of course, to uh, execute any of the men involved in the uh, Brussels airport attack, but it did manage to put down uh, one of the victims of the attack, who's now been chalked up as another victim. Uh, this time, it's Canada uh, that is that is on this slope, and gosh, is it slippery. In 2016, uh, the lovely liberal Canadian government introduced what it called the Medical Assistance in Dying, or MAID Act. And uh, again, as in so many other Western countries, it was meant to be only for people with terminal illness. And that's how it got through. It's put through as if it's incredibly strict. Two years ago, uh, the Canadian government expanded the law. And uh, two years ago, it was allowed to encompass people who had non-terminal conditions. So you can see where this is going. As of March next year, this is going to be expanded again, and it will be allowed to include medically assisted dying for people whose sole underlying condition is mental illness. Now, I suggest that anyone who isn't at this point ethically concerned isn't thinking deeply about this. And there's a specific case you mentioned as well, Douglas. I think it's Lisa Pauly. Can you, can you tell, her a bit about, tell us a bit about her? Yes, she gave an interview recently. She's one of a, a number of people who, who've said, you know, they're, they're sort of looking forward to next March. Uh, the Canadian government itself presents uh, the development of the new law as if it's a sort of wonderful, exciting new opportunity for the Canadian public. It, 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 it's pretty dystopian if you think about it like that. Uh, a woman called Lisa Pauly is one of those who seems to be viewing it in that light. She's a 47-year-old woman. And she's suffered from anorexia uh, for most of her life. She's had you know, it's very debilitating eating disorder. And, and unfortunately for her, um, unlike many young women who have it, she hasn't been able to shake it off. Um, she hasn't been able to get rid of it. She currently weighs, I think, six stone, six pounds. Uh, she uh, is too weak to carry groceries back from the shop. She says, every day is hell. I'm so tired. I'm done. I've tried everything. I feel like I've lived my life. Uh, was the quote she gave. And uh, as I say in the piece, a 47-year-old who feels that they've lived their life uh, is a 47-year-old in need of help. And I would submit that uh, anorexia, which is an incredibly debilitating condition, as anyone knows who's either had it themselves or had a family member or a loved one who's had it, 
knows that it requires very, very intense help, love, support, and much more. But the message given off by a society that says, actually, we've got a cure for anorexia. It's medical assistance in dying. Is a society that gives out one of the worst messages possible to the predominantly young women who suffer from that condition. Mm. And like you say, I think it would be rightfully seen as abhorrent if you told someone with anorexia that they should or they're right to think that they should kill themselves. But Canada seems to be sort of sleepwalking towards this. I mean, you mentioned in your in your first answer the fact that this is a very liberal, soft, cuddly government. Do you think that's linked to the fact that they've just sort of lost their moral compass on this? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, to do something truly atrocious, you have to wrap it up these days in the language of compassion. You can do almost anything, get away with almost anything in a modern society if you talk about it in compassionate terms. I give the example at the beginning of the piece, I opened the piece by talking about Martin Amos's 1991 masterpiece, Time's Arrow. It's a, it's, it's a novel where everything goes backwards. Time goes backwards. Everything happens in reverse. Um, every daily action. And uh, it includes, uh, as part of its, its, its narrative, is the Holocaust in reverse. And I say this is very, it's very hard to say anything new about the Holocaust. But Martin Amis manages, or have a new light on it. Martin Amis manages, actually, in that novel, um, when towards what is the end of the Holocaust in the reverse, which is, of course, the beginning of the Holocaust as it happened, uh, the bodies that they take out of the oven and bring into life, one of the people who works in the, in the crematoria starts to worry that the bodies that they're taking out of the oven seem to be increasingly deformed. And the character in the Amos novel starts to wonder whether it's worth bringing these people to life at all, uh, which is, of course, a reference to that way in which, and, and I'm not using the Holocaust to say what Canada is doing is about to lead to the murder of millions of Jews or anything like that. I'm saying that it's a reminder of the fact such great atrocities from history can start with things that people can nod along in the name of compassion. A lot of eugenics went this way, started this way. Um, a medically assisted dying, assistance to people with debilitating conditions, and much more, the mentally ill. And I say that there's a particular corner of this, and I pointed this out in the magazine before. I pointed this out when Britain was considering new laws on this. Much of the problem of this is the elision in our day uh, between medical illness and mental illness, physical illness and mental illness. Huge amount of work has been done. And again, you might be in favor of this or against it. A huge amount of work has been done by government, by the NHS, by celebrities, even royals, to talk about the way in which medical, uh, the way in which uh, um, mental illness it should be regarded as being on a par with physical illness. Once you get onto euthanasia, medically assisted dying, as they call it again in Canada, made. Once you get onto that, and you say mental, Ill you have a society that says mental illness and physical illness are on a par, then you allow people to find a way on the state to be killed, effectively assisted to die because they have a mental illness. I give the example in the piece. This has already come up. This is not a um, this is not a dystopian uh, fear mongering. Uh, last year, a member of the Canadian Armed Forces, a veteran, called this Veterans uh, uh, Veterans Affairs Canada, which is a sort of veterans support uh, association. He was suffering from PTSD. So bear this in mind. This is a, this is a, um, a young man who had uh, been sent to war by his country, had presumably seen some of the things you see in war. War is always unpleasant always uh, traumatizing to some extent to the people who participate in it. This man had been sent out by his country. He's now returned. He should be getting the best possible care as all veterans should be. When he called Veterans Affairs Canada unprompted, it was suggested by the person he spoke with that perhaps he should try euthanasia. Now, PTSD is especially for, it's been somewhat overdiagnosed in recent years, but PTSD for soldiers and veterans is a very serious thing which needs very serious, again, love, care, compassion, and treatment. The idea that you would, as a society, say, we will send our soldiers out to fight and kill and potentially die for the country, and if they find it all too traumatic, once they get home, we can kill them. 
This is not a dystopia. This has already started, and all in the name of compassion. Societies that do this will, among other things, become far less, just as the Netherlands and Belgium are far less developed in palliative care than Britain is, and the doctors involved have told me this, because they have euthanasia in those countries. So a country like Canada that believes that, that, that medically assisted dying, euthanasia, is a good response to trauma, to anorexia, and much more, will be a society that, that is less good at treating people with those conditions in the way in which they should be treated because they will be offering death as one of the options on the board of treatments. Mm. And you mentioned in the piece as well that, you know, and, and as you were saying then, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of state's capacity to sort of help someone with mental illness, whilst euthanasia is almost the cheap, easy option. Do you, do you get the sense there's almost like a, a financial incentive to push people towards euthanasia now? Well, I, I don't know if there is at the moment, but there could well be at some point. One of the, the, the moral issues that has often come up with euthanasia, even for people with medical conditions that are terminal, is can we be sure that loved ones aren't encouraging them to this effectively to get a cash bonanza? It seems unimaginable that anyone would, but human nature being what it is, of course, some people will. So there has always been this kind of fear, even with the most clear-cut case that people in favour of euthanasia can present, which is people with uh, um, terminal illnesses uh, uh, who, are, who are close to the, the, to the end anyway. Um, uh, of course, uh, it's, it's, it's not just possible, but likely the financial incentives will start to step into this. They always do. Uh, um, the Canadian government has had such extraordinary overreach in recent years in things like, again, as I've written about before in the magazine, the closure of bank accounts of people who are, who are critics of it at home, the um, corruption of the Canadian media. All of these things have been done in the name of compassion and much more. The Canadian government is already pretty corrupted, actually, among Western governments. Uh, um, and uh, it, it seems to be able to get away, Trudeau himself seems to be able to get away with almost anything because he does it in this dippy um, sort of floppy-haired, foppish language of compassion and love whilst showing very little compassion or love for the people of his country and, in fact, a sort of disdain for the average person. Uh, I have absolutely no faith in the Canadian government to be fair in its treatment of its citizenry if they have any views that the Canadian government doesn't disagree with. The idea that the choice of life or death could be in the hands of the Canadian government gives me the shudders. Again, this is a government that believes it is too superior, uh, too morally pure, to ever think of executing for somebody for a crime, such as mass murder, child rape, or anything else. Far too morally superior. Like Britain, like all the EU countries, we think we've got beyond that. We've got beyond public execution. We've got beyond private executions, executions in prisons of prisoners. We're too, too, we're, we're past that. We've developed. But we are, or Canada is as a society, able to allow and encourage, indeed, people with uh, me mental conditions like anorexia, like PTSD, to be effectively killed by the state. I don't think the state has that right anywhere. I, I cannot see how a country posing as a liberal democracy can go down this route without criticism. Mm. And and finally, Douglas, I wonder what you think about the lessons for Britain here. I mean, as you say, there's been a long running campaign for euthanasia in the case of terminal illnesses. Do you think it's possible to have that and stop there? Or do you think once that sort of Rubicon has been crossed of the state taking a life, then you're sort of opening yourself up for a world of horrors? Well, I've had this argument on the Spectator podcast before, not least with, with Lord Faulkner, who was one of the people uh, pushing the Assisted Dying Act in the House of Lords. Um, he, he was one of those who, again, he, it's all, oh, Douglas is getting all slippery slope on us. Um, if I was Lord Faulkner or one of the people in that campaign in the UK, and I know and have spoken with people involved in that, I respect the opinions of some of them very, very much. But if I were them, I would look at what was happening in Canada and think, those Canadians have mucked up our whole case. You know, the whole 
way in which the the assisted dying in Britain Act would come in would be if it was incredibly carefully defined and incredibly carefully policed. And it is already clear in my view from the Netherlands and Belgium, which are not far away from us as societies in any uh, ethical or geographical sense, it's already clear from there how slippery this slope is. And when Lord Falcon and others say oh, Douglas is getting all slippery slope on us, now I would say again, look at Canada. Look at what you can do in Canada now in the name of compassion. Look at the Canadian government's websites, the way in which it presents Next March as being this wonderful new opportunity for Canadians. This really is something atrocious happening in our own time. And as the editor of the Spectator, Fraser Nelson, has said to me a number of times, and I often quote it, uh, instead of just racking through the past and looking at what other people did and how astonishingly awful it was, also think of what is happening in your own time that our successors might think uh, is equally awful and look at it in an equally despising light. Try to work out what they are now and try to stop them early. I would suggest that when it comes to medically assisted dying in the West and the slippery slope in these ultra-liberal democracies, it is just such a case. Thank you very much, Douglas. Unlock unlimited access to The Spectator magazine for free for one month and then pay just £1 a week after that. Go to spectator.co.uk forward slash best to subscribe today. Mm -hmm.